Yeah. The intelligence chapter. Yeah, intelligence. Defined as the ability to learn, adapt, and solve problems. And intelligence, for whatever that means, has correlated highly to success, again, whatever that means, in many areas. But what is it? And more importantly for us, how do we study it? How do we define it? How do we operationalize intelligence? It's one of those big scary things that people are afraid they have or don't have. And how does it affect the rest of their lives? Because is it just one thing? And that's the problem we had when we first started studying IQ, is that we believed it was just one thing. Is it just one part of the brain? Can the brain have a lot of different IQs depending on the part of the brain we're talking about? Or is it how they work together to create intelligence? Well, there's no real good answer for that. But what we had is back in the beginning of intelligence research, we had a man named Alfred Binet. So what he did was he constructed tests to test people on how well they solved problems. And this was called the IQ test. And what he did was he standardized this test, which means he had enough people take it that he got a nice easy bell curve and he had standard deviations. Now, what he did was he made 0 and 200, the two ends of the bell curve, and the average was going to be 100. But if there's one thing we know about human beings, is we tend to believe that we're all above average. So the average belief that someone has in their IQ will be about 115. But the average IQ has to be 100, or it'll be renormed. Those numbers will be recalculated so that the average will be 100. Anything below 100 will be below average. Anything above 100 will be above average. And we have standard deviations that you know what I'm talking about, but we don't have to go into it exactly what a standard deviation is again. And what this studied was what we call Spearman's G, little g inside brackets, and it's a general intelligence, which means here they're studying for one thing. And the problem with these intelligence tests is they were not culturally normed. For example, on the test created by Alfred Binet, who was a white guy, people in Caucasian cultures would do better than minority cultures because the questions were normed for Caucasian cultures. And this created a lot of argument as to why people in minority cultures were doing poorly on IQ tests. So what they did was they asked questions based on minority cultures and minorities did better on those tests. So since the beginning of IQ tests, there have been arguments about whether those IQ tests are valid. So another researcher by the name of Terman decided he was going to follow a lot of kids who he gave these IQ tests to and when they did well, he was going to follow them through the rest of their lives to see if they actually achieved higher success. The problem with Terman's study is that these termites, as they were called, he would interfere with their lives. For example, one termite who got caught stealing a car and was in front of a judge, well, Terman himself went to that judge and says, hey, judge, you know what? This guy is in my study. He's got a really high IQ. We're expecting good things out of him. Would you mind just going easy on him this time? And the judge essentially let him off with a slap on the wrists. He interfered with the study. He gave his own study major validity issues. So in the end, the study really only gave us evidence that for the most part, people with high IQs have the same drop out of school rates, have the same suicide rates, have mostly the same rates as those kids who did not score as high the kids with higher IQs were more likely to adopt new cultural norms. But in terms of success, if we can even define success, the differences were not statistically significant. So the moral of the story there probably is, it's not so much the intelligence that matters as what you do with it. However, some of Terman's kids did grow up to be very powerful people. For example, one went to the United States government based on his IQ. Because at the time, the United States government, and a lot of people in general, decided that IQ was the end-all and be-all of what you were needed to succeed. And so they put this guy in charge of carpet bombing Japan, and he did a marvelous job of logistically setting up carpet bombing of Japan. And then they put him in charge of Vietnam. While these kids may have had brilliant IQs, 
morally, they weren't as adept. And it's not hard to go to find examples in popular culture and in life. For example, a Sheldon Cooper is going to have a off the scale, not really off the scale, because that's impossible. But he's going to have a pretty high IQ. But socially and morally, mm, it's not so high. So what researchers did was, is they divided things up into different categories where people could score high IQ. And Sternberg was the first to do this. He liked threes, so we decided that there's going to be three versions of IQ, each separate. And what he had was creative intelligence, which is how well someone thought of things creatively, how could they use things in new ways, or divergent problem solving, where you can have a lot of different answers. Then they had analytical intelligence, which is convergent intelligence. For example, mathematics, where you get one answer and ways to get that one answer. And then you've got practical intelligence, which is essentially leadership quality. You've got the creative, the logical, and then the leadership. And that was his idea. Research didn't really pan it out. And Gardner, another researcher, says that wasn't enough. So Howard Gardner came up with eight different intelligences. And his were divided into linguistic, which means how good is someone with words. Logical, mathematical, how well is someone with math. Spatial, how well someone can rotate things in their, in their minds. If I can pick up an image of you, turn it over in my mind, turn it back and set you back down. Just in my head, spatial memory. And there's a test on R's at the end of this where we'll, we'll show you what a spatial memory test actually looks like. And spatial memory is linked to better scores in chemistry for being able to turn those molecules around inside your head. Musical, musical intelligence. Kinesthetic, body, dance, movement intelligence. Interpersonal, which is how well do you understand other people. Intrapersonal, which is how well do you understand yourself. And naturalistic, which is how well do you understand the natural world. For example, minerals and, and bridge building materials and tensile strengths and things like that. And geniuses can happen in any of these categories. And there's different categories where people have different intelligence levels. And what this does is, if you only have one intelligence factor and you tell a kid that they're not good at that one intelligence factor, what are they going to do? They're probably going to give up. However, if you have different areas where that kid can excel, they're probably going to focus on that one area and not give up. And they're likely to excel in that one area that they believe they're really good at, because that's the way we are. Now, we have something called the Flynn Effect, which shows us that IQ has been going up over the last few decades. It's very controversial, because is it really that IQ is going up, or are we just getting better at testing? Kids today take a lot more tests now than kids took in the 50s. And so it's only natural that the more often you take a test, the better you'll do at it. And that is essentially the study program for the ACT and SAT, is that if you get an ACT, SAT tutor, they'll teach you the strategies. But what they really do is they make you take five, six, seven of those tests so that you get better at taking the test by the time you have to actually go and do the important one. Because the more often you take a test, the better you become at it. The more often you do anything, the better you become at it. Long-term potentiation. There's a couple of different kinds of intelligence. For example, when we're young, we're better at what's called fluid intelligence. How well you can think around things, how well you can manipulate things in your world and change them to use that pencil. Use it as a dart. Yeah. Fluid intelligence means you can actually problem solve by using things in creative ways. When people get older, they have what's more called crystallized intelligence, which means they're not thinking about how to use something in a new way. They're just better at thinking about how to use it in the same old way. That's crystallized intelligence. Something that happens as we get older. We tend not to think of things in new and creative ways. Though we're trying to change that, because the longer you can spend in that time where you think of things creatively, the better you can fend off the brain problems of old age. Puzzles have shown to be a very beneficial defense against brain decay. So, while we use IQ, we have to be very careful with an IQ test because no one test, no one test at anything is going to be good enough to determine what's actually going on. 
For example, the IQ test you take to get into college, the SAT, the ACT. While the score is important, it can't be the only thing a school looks at. A school, in determining who's going to get in, is not only going to look at the ACT, they're also going to look at your rank in class, your grade point average, your letters of recommendation, and probably also an essay. And all of these things combined are going to give a picture. Because we can't just use any one test to determine something as important as choosing personnel. It would be unethical. Because who's to say that that one test is valid? However, if you get five tests and they show you the same results, if they're all rely reliable with each other, then you've probably got a pretty good picture of what's going on. That's why when you take an IQ test, you really want to take a couple of times and then find a couple of different ways to take it. That's why when you have something important, like say for a job interview, one test is not going to be enough. For example, if you've taken a job interview and they give you a personality test, usually those personality tests are based on what's called the Myers-Briggs system. And if they just use that one test, that would not be valid. That would not be ethical. What they have to do is take your references, take your working history, take all of those things and try to create the most rounded picture they can. No one test is good enough to determine any one value especially when it's important. For example, the Army IQ test. Originally, the Army IQ test looked a lot like the actual IQ test. But it turned out a lot of people were failing because they only made it to sixth grade. They didn't have the advanced reading skills. So what they did was they created a test like this, where you had to fill in the missing features. Now, the problem with these missing features is that some of them are cultural. For example, if someone had never played tennis before, how would they know that the net is missing? So IQ tests, they're always going to be argued because they're more than likely always going to be unfair to somebody. Now for kids in elementary school, what we use is called the WISC, the Weschler scale. And here's an example of the Weschler scale. Starts out in kindergarten pretty easy. How many apples? Which one of these is different? By sixth grade, they've gotten into the complicated word problem questions. So that brings us to language in IQ. And language is very important for IQ because, as I say, we remember things as words for the most part. So that means that our ability to remember words is going to really affect our ability to use our intelligence and our, mem and our memory. However, I'm going to give this lecture to the professor from Yale, Professor Bloom, because he finds the lecture on language to be fascinating, and I find it not so much. But I'm going to give you definitions just so you have them here. A phoneme is going to be your smallest unit of sound. And if you've ever heard of phonetics, like our a ah, or our b or a k or a d, smallest unit. A morphine is our smallest string of sounds to create one sound. Ba, pop, mom, dad, car. One syllable words. And then syntax is defined as our rules of language, our grammar, is what syntax. Now, even with syntax, we need context to know what we're talking about. And context is the meaning around the word. So if I say that post is falling over, I could mean a fence post, I could mean a military post, I could mean a post office. It's context that tells you the difference. We have a critical or a sensitive period for learning language, and it's pretty young. It's between the ages of two and three. And if we don't learn that language then, while our brain is developing, it makes it more difficult to learn it later on. For example, do you think it would be easier to learn a language when you're three or learn a language now? Well, research has shown us that it is easier to learn a language, a second language even, when you're three versus when you're 20. Because when you're learning a language and being 20 years old, starting kind of late, your odds of getting rid of that first language accent are very, very slim. You'll learn the words just fine and you'll learn the context pretty well. But the actual fluency of not having that accent, those accents are very hard to drop. It can be done with a lot of work. But when you're learning a language when you're two to five years old, it's essentially effortless learning that accent. And that's intelligence. What you do with the intelligence that you have is a lot more important than how much intelligence you have.